it Ooh. was just one of the wacky things that we do, you know? Yeah. Um, that was, you know, you can either chop the turkey's head off with him being terrified or you can let him go in a salt field and, and just burn him down with a 6.5 Creedmoor. <laughs> Jason Vincent, you son of a gun. Oh, I've missed you. My ride or die. I've missed you. How you been? Good, dude. Good. Yeah. What's going on? Not much, man. Um, What's going on at Field Ethos? Dude, all kinds of stuff. Um, fun stuff. Yeah, we're doing, um, we're dabbling in the film stuff a little bit more, mm-hmm. and we've got kind of a plan for that. Um, Filming, fishing, hunting. Hunting, well, all of the above, really, um, you know. We just got back from Mongolia. Did a really fun film on that. I'll show that to you later. Um, that that was uh, you and Don went Don Junior. Yeah, and well, Donnie. Oh, really? Yeah. Pick so I son. flew. I flew to Miami and picked up Donnie. Don was already in Turkey on a. So Don called. He's like, "All right, we're gonna do this. Uh, we're gonna go to Turkey and go spear fishing, and then we're going from there to Mongolia." And I was like, "Right on." Well, I didn't. Um, I didn't know. Turkey was like a spear fishing Dude, fishing bluefin tuna. Wait till you see the pictures of this. It's just unbelievable. Okay. Giant bluefin tuna. And Don's like, Don's a legit spear fisherman. So, um, and Dave Etter, uh, who, yeah. who Dave and I kind of CEO field ethos together. Um, he's, he's a really good spear fisherman too. He's Dave's just a badass dude. And, um, this that's, was like, that's a, like Don's main fishing buddy. Huh? It's like his main spear fishing buddy. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so Dave and uh, so, I told them I would meet them in Turkey at the end of this spear fishing trip. Um, you know, Dave. Dave was, you know, this this was a Dave Etter trip for sure. So um, I just said I'll meet you guys in Turkey. I'd already been doing some travel with you in Argentina and stuff yeah. like that. And um, and so I met them in Turkey, and then we went to Mongolia. But first, I flew down to Miami and picked up Donnie, mm-hmm. and um, and took him to Turkey with me to uh, meet up with the guys. And then we went on to Mongolia. Yeah, he's been taking him on hunts a lot the last. That was years, not so. even the kid's first uh, Mongolia hunt. He had already hunted <laughs> Mongolia before. So what were you guys hunting there? Um, we were hunting ibex and argali. So ibex is a goat species. You, you're you're familiar. Really cool looking goat species. If you've never heard of it, yeah, they they have them in Spain. They have them in Spain. Um, the Gobi ibex is a much bigger bodied ibex. It's a it's a fairly sizable animal. Uh, and then the argali is a sheep species. So think uh, rams with big curly horns. Um, really cool. And uh, so yeah, we were after those and just amazing place just really cool is that the only place are they biggest like why is mongolia a destination for that? mongolia is a destination for the argali species um so you've got gobi argali you've got altai argali and then you have um uh shit. there's a, there's another like kind of subspecies that they've delineated as its own species but it's yeah. it, very big sheep uh and if you're trying to kind of get if you're trying to work your way through to where you have uh, all the sheep species. That's certainly a spot you need to stop off and, and sheep hunt. So, mm-hmm. uh, And they're really big, and there's a lot of them, and it, it's just kind of an epic place to do it. That's cool. Yeah. Well, what about, okay, so you, you were here, I don't know, we did the podcast last, or Jason, it was a while back. It's been a while. So Field Ethos was pretty new still. Yeah, it's still pretty new. So w- when last time you were here, you didn't have the the periodical, the printed yep. periodical. Yep. Um, you guys are doing a bunch more stuff now. Yeah. So we got we have the podcast, we have the print journal, um, we have obviously the online content that we do, uh, which is more of short form stories that are usually a lot of fun. Um, social media. A lot of good. Writing. We're doing some films, uh, and we're getting into some of the product side that I'm really excited about. Because um, I always wanted Field Ethos to be seen as a lifestyle brand, not a hunting brand. Yeah. Um, so uh, we well, have you guys are growing. I mean, even your your hat, the content, the the creativity you guys come up with. That's uh, I guess the Detroit Tigers Magnum, Magnum PI hat. Yeah. 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 Um, that's so pretty cool. I think the guys that are involved in Field Ethos all bring like their own level of creativity and style to it. And I th- like whenever someone pitches their version of of something cool my reaction is almost always, damn, that's so cool. Like, but yeah, we've, so we've, you know, we've got, we're going into kind of the, the product stuff. We've got some things. Yeah. uh, You guys have had knives. You do collabs. We're doing a collab with a gun now. Yep. Uh, we're doing some collabs. We're also, um, we're releasing kind of our own label of like shirts and shorts and, um, you know, 
lifestyle products that we we have designed that we feel like everybody's going to want to have. The John Hill Mimosa set, dude, is we fucking have fucking awesome. We have it. Like we <laughs> have stemless that. mimosas and and um, we have coffee mugs, American made coffee mugs that have a fill line for your coffee, and then um, a much bigger fill line for when you put coffee and whiskey in there. Like we want you to yeah, have I, I, appropriate I mean, just portions. Creative, uh, uh, creative ideas and simple expected basic products yeah. that make it really cool like your one where it says take a lap when you turn the coffee up on the bottom fucking cool the mimosa kit so cool because you know like knowing john hill who i'm sure is the inspiration for this Absolutely. Mimosa kit, um you know uh, who, who's probably one of your best friends i guess but yes, where it's yeah. it's like the fill line is for champagne and then oj is this it's much. got a quarter inch of oj in that <laughs> a healthy amount of vitamin c <laughs> it's great yeah yeah a lot of the products i mean it's just very clever and it is interesting and it's it's a cool way to support a company whether you know it's you guys doing primarily media stuff or even us you know going through the painstaking process of manufacturing products it's it, it's like these simple things that we try to do too sometimes whether it's hats shirts stickers whatever that show the personality of the company oh that the jose shout out to jose dude but love <laughs> the jose sticker the new jose sticker is unreal have you guys even put that out publicly yet yeah ba design? basically thomas and i've been talking about it for two years because people send us a ton of alcohol and stuff it's yeah just i guess like being fans it used to be to skip the line for the back order and so we're very grateful so i've been talking about it for a long time it's like i wanted to do like a shirt that you could only get if you sent us alcohol yeah. as, as a thank you and so that got shelved because we've been doing a lot of stuff. So Thomas gets around to it and does a whole line of, okay. So when he, he turned it up a notch, of course, and it's if somebody sends us rum, we need a rum sticker yeah. and, you know, wine or champagne or whatever it is, tequila. And so our homie, <laughs> Jose. <laughs> Jose and Nate. Um, <laughs> Who you can see on the pages of Field Ethos with his ass hanging out, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. We use him for the ad. The ad, the, the Q ad. ad in volume two. Um, it's just a picture of Jose off in the distance, uh, with his buttocks hanging out, uh, yeah. as he's taking a leak, like a toddler with his <laughs> pants around his ankles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and Jose, I mean, God bless him. One of my favorite human beings and he's beautiful to me, but he does not look like David Beckham once say, or, well, or, I mean, or Brad Pitt. A few <laughs> and, of us do. A few of us so, do. Yeah. yeah. Only a few of us. But, uh, like what just a legend of a human being and, and uh, the, he just, does it, it's it, he's an interesting contrast of, of personalities jose in most ways that people are insecure about does not give a fuck and it just makes him so endearing and then he is such a scaredy cat a little sissy about flying or traveling or different things where like most of us are like what are you even talking about yeah he's ridiculous and it just makes him like Oh, God, just the most lovable person yeah. in the fucking world. But the thing is, is he's like a scaredy cat about these things, but he hikes up his pants and he does it anyway, yeah. which makes it even better. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's <laughs> Reached down and watch. grabs those balls and says, you know, when, when we were doing a helicopter call in South Africa there at, in the Eastern Cape in the mountains, so we we all all go on this call. We're, sh we're trying to shoot the spring buck and wildebeest out of this area where the cattle, the good grass for the cattle and um, the only way really to do it up there, because you've been there and it's all wide open, the only way to really shoot a lot of them and make a dent in the population is from a helicopter. Yeah. There's no other way. Yeah. And so we're doing that. And Jose, of course, had never been in a helicopter. And he was shitting his pants and couldn't go. And we all go, it comes down to him. And the last guy, Jay, goes before Jose. And he's Jose is like hyperventilating, basically. He's like, Kevin, you think... Uh, uh, he says, I, I really don't want to do this, but I, 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 I know I'll regret it. And I was like, Jose, it's not even that. It's like if you try to refuse, you and I are going to fist fight. Yeah. Like yeah. it's just it because I love you. I know you. I know how fun and awesome this is and epic it'll be. It's going to be one of the most fun things that you're ever going to do. You have to do it yeah. or, or we're throwing down. And he's like – and I was like, everybody's going to help me. We'll kick your ass and then put you on the helicopter. Sure. So just – and he's like – you, you think Andrew would be okay if I had like a shot of whiskey? Uh, <laughs> and he had to take like two shots to get on the helicopter. I was actually going to I was actually going to ask if you guys did that because um last time I did that um I got on the chopper 
Um, I might have had a, a sharpener or two before I got on the <laughs> chopper and started shooting things. And man, it just like loosened me up. Yeah, and, I mean, it's good yeah. for shooting in general. And you can't really say it publicly much because people think, yeah. oh, alcohol. And you can't have steady thy and hand. It's like, no, you know, Ethan will talk about when he was uh, started at SIG out of Cotwell. He was in college when he was an intern at SIG as an engineer. And he, he was, lived in Germany for six months at SIG. And, and, um, they test fire all the guns by hand. Oh, back then, they did the SIG pistols, the classic line pistols. And a target would go in the box. They shot at 25 meters. And every gun, every gun shot better after lunch. And it's because they would all go have like three shots of snops yep. before they shot. And so then after lunch, everybody's got, you know buzz enough to be relaxed yep. and they shoot better it's a real thing it, i mean it is a real thing but you know it's like a slippery slope to start like advocating that and stuff people that can't handle it or you take no well there's whatever. a huge difference so i was a game warden um before oh, you yeah. know, many moons ago and um there is a big difference in uh hunting while intoxicated and just hunting after a drink or two um uh, and there are yeah. a lot of people that unfortunately you know, th th it's a slippery slope for them. Like you said, yeah. like you have two drinks, you're going to have 10 drinks and then you're going to shoot like, no, uh, that's not okay. But moderation, I think just about anything's okay. Well, so. I, I'm sure for even people that don't shoot, if you play golf, which I don't play golf, but I can imagine because we can all go to the range and be, you know, Navy SEAL snipers. Yep. Hunting is a whole different thing. And I bet with golf, it's the same thing. It's such a mental thing. Um, I bet that, people that play golf can understand this you have a couple drinks two drinks you probably golf better you have four drinks you probably golf worse yeah absolutely and, and and it's probably the same thing with shooting back to jose we should pop the sticker up right now thomas pop the sticker pop the sticker up but so thomas's idea for that is basically a tequila bottle <laughs> with jose on it with his pants down with uh, jose always makes tiny tiny pp jokes and so he has like the tiny baby pee pee joke. Or, so you know what that one that one reminded me of? So there's this tiny little dick on on Jose on this sticker, um, and we were going to Africa, and and Mike Scobie wrote an article for us um, about like how to prepare for a trip to Africa gear wise. He went through it, and he was talking about you know you you need a pair of short shorts. You don't wear long shorts like to hunt in Africa. You wear a pair of short shorts because it's hot, and um, and he's like. Uh, you know, you want them short enough to where you almost see your dick and balls, but not quite. Uh, and he goes, shout out. And he, he writes in his article. This is this is so funny. He writes in his article. He goes, and since we're talking about dick and balls, a side note on manscaping. Um, when you're hunting in Africa and you strip down to take a splash in the pool and camp, if they have one, all you want people to be able to see is a little bit of head and a lot of mane, much like a mature lion. And I was like, Jesus, like, how did we get here from talking about what kind of boots we needed yeah. to take from? from but that's that's the kind of stuff we do at Fioritas. We like we do whatever we want. If we Say think it's you know. funny, we're just going to put it in there. Don't really I, care what everybody else thinks. Well, I, I think it's good. You you know, that's interesting to me because you sort of know my style as well. But hunting like firearms, it, it's kind of like there's this old guard and this is the way we do things. Yeah. These are the traditions that someone came up with who we're not sure these are the rules that we have for etiquette with hunting or talking about hunting or how you should hunt. And, you know, this is what is professional. Yeah. Um, and that's fucking ridiculous. And like, we don't like do that. So the firearms industry is boring overall. Yeah. Hunting industry is even more boring. Yep. But these are two of the most exciting things in the world. And we found a way to make it mundane and boring as hell. Yep. Stupid. We've, we've, we've like cleaned it up to, to make it, to where everybody like like Let's i give a fuck if you anyone. accept what we're doing like i don't give a fuck left me a long time ago as john hill likes to say and um and so i don't care like what you think my hunt should look like or what you think uh, just about anything about me like i don't i really don't give a fuck what you think hunting to me is this adventure um we kill stuff we don't harvest things um you know it is it is what it is and we just don't sanitize it to the point where Somebody is going to be um, somebody that, that already has this preconceived notion of hating hunting. They're not going to come to Fioritas and feel any better about it. I can promise you that. Well, um, well, I don't know. I think maybe I ride the fence with that. But I'm newer to hunting than you are. But well, So so what do you mean? It, it's like you guys kill stuff. So it's just uh, like non-apologetic for like the small part of your brain that men are to hunt or gather. Yeah, it's like it's unapologetic. Like this is what we do. 
it is the oldest adventure on the planet, right? So like earliest man um, had to hunt to survive yeah. and they would leave their wherever they lived, their village, their tribe. They would go on these hunts. They would bring back meat for everybody else to eat. Dude, they were doing it with spears. I mean, they were like defending their lives with spears and and sharpened stones and and dude, it was the it's the it's the original adventure, right? Like, and and you would not be here if somebody in your genetic code wasn't a hunter, you know. So like, it's it's yeah. there whether you like it or not, whether you want it to be a part of you well, or not, it's there. Well, I mean, to say that, I I think then that turns into um. Uh, like like meat eater, I think you guys have had issue with that in the way he talks about it. Where it's a certain philosophy where people think, well, I was taught by who the fuck ever your cousin Ricky or your dad that if you shoot it, you should eat it. And well, that's kind of stupid. But it's yeah. also I also believe like, like I think I see both sides of all these arguments. It's um, why would I like I love meat. Like, I like leather seats in my car. I like leather shoes. I like all these things. Why would I ask another man to kill something that I'm not willing to kill? Yeah. Like, I I mean, just for me, and I don't know where that comes from. That didn't come from my dad. He doesn't hunt or anything. But that's kind of the way I feel about it. Like, any of it is sort of okay, but the judgment of someone else seems stupid. And just that argument, well, if you sh shot it, you should eat it. Yeah. And, well, I, I, don't, I don't think, I, I don't think we really. take it. I don't think any of us have any ill will towards meat eater. Um, you know, I think that if you, I think you need to have a bigger, a bigger message than just hunt to eat. That's the only reason we do this, right? Like it's all. Oh about no, food. the adventure to me, like yeah. when I first got into it, it was about okay, I wanted to hunt and and shoot this animal, and I don't know if this is normal, but I assume it is for people who start out in hunting when they're influenced by someone else, and you go on the first hunt. You know, if you've never killed anything, that's that was really the hyper focus. Sure. It's, oh my God! And then at the end of this, I've got to pull a trigger and like kill something, and and that was like the connection that I had or the emotional part of the hunt. But now, you know, I've been on hundreds of hunts, yeah. and it's it's actually what you're saying. It's the adventure that I love, like the shooting the thing at the end. Like I like it. I don't mind it, but it it's like the adventure with my buddies. Um, Everything that I learn on a hunt, you know, you think I started taking Thomas. He'd never shot anything or been on a hunt. Now he's been on tons of hunts with me. And it's like, it's an adventure. The stuff that we learn every time, whether it's you see a 17 foot, you know, rock python, or you see an animal attack another animal, you almost fall off a cliff trying to do this ridiculous thing to get in position yeah. to shoot this kudu. There's like something that you can't script. You don't expect that happens every time that makes the hunt epic. So what do you got? What do you got, Thomas? Simply just the sundowner at the oh, end of the hunt. Oh boy, Woo. man, I mean, that's a that's a fantastic period of time. Few things are better. Man, you and I have had a pile of those. <laughs> yeah. Um. So in on this Mongolia trip, um, one of my favorite parts about the whole trip, I so we we there was this Mongolian sheep guide. This guy is just amazing, um, and he drives around in this twenty year old Russian. A jeep essentially i mean this like bare bones four-wheel drive jeep you said russian so yeah yeah he i mean and he hauls ass all over the place in this thing like if you're in another vehicle you will not keep up with him so i asked him one day i was like hey you mind if i just jump in with you those other guys can ride in those other vehicles he's like get in so i get in with this guy and i mean my head is literally bouncing off the ceiling because the suspension in this thing sucks we're going over these things at like Mach three. I mean, we're we're just hauling ass up these mountains in this Russian vehicle, and I look over and this dude's got like a Virginia Slim like hanging out of his <laughs> mouth and he's lit. He's just, it's a Mongolian guy, dude. Yeah, and then we start heading down the other side of this mountain, and and we got to turn to like hit this trail, and he turns and he like locks up the brakes, and this thing fishtails to the side, and we like execute this perfect like slide into this trail, and then he takes off, and I'm like Mongolian drifting, dude. He drifted into this thing, and I was like, this is badass, like being up here you know, 10,000 feet in a Russian Jeep bouncing around with this crazy Mongolian dude. It was it, like, that was, I'll never forget that as long as I live. That's the epic part of the trip. Yeah. Like yeah. there are things like that that will stand out. Like the, the, the kill is, I mean, you and I know this and any hunter that, that listens to this will, will can hopefully relate to this, but you go on some big hunt and it, it you might be gone for 10 days or two weeks or whatever. The kill lasts half a second. Mm from the time you pull that trigger to the time the animal dies, that's half of a second of two weeks. Like, so surely it's not just about that. 
You know what I mean? Like it can't just no. Be. And I think a lot of criticism because if I post like a hunting photo or something, you know, inevitably I'll get one or two posts or messages like, "I hope somebody does that to you. Fuck you, you piece of shit. You should be shot." And it's like, well, uh, yeah. I mean, that's what you're focusing on. That's not what yeah a hunt really is. But when we, you know, even like the helicopter thing. So, so I have done all kinds of hunting, and I sort of. You know, you just end up in a position of you hunt what you like the best. And to me, currently, I really like Africa for lots of reasons. And I like free range. Yep. Um, And that doesn't mean I won't hunt high fence. And I see a purpose in it. And But, you know, like most of my high fence hunting now, like even now Crusader has a a piece of property that's maybe 30,000 acres or so that's high fence. And that's in the mountains. And people say, oh, I went to a high fence place and it was just as difficult as free free range. And that might be, uh, you know, I hear some people say that and they just want to justify, they want to go on a hunt, they want to go on a week and they want to shoot 10 animals and they want this size animal and all. Well, you better go to a high fence. Yeah. Um, but this is a legit high fence where it can be the most difficult hunt in the world and you can never find an animal. Like 100%. they can decide. Yeah. In, in 30,000 acres in the mountains. Eh. But it's fine to me, but some of the you know best adventure I've had is like okay, we're, we have to cull animals. Oh yeah, I want on that. Yeah. Like I will stay away from free range hunting to go on that thing when we're gonna cull because you know for me too, it's like a process of testing product, um, learning about the animals every time I can have an experience, and then you know especially testing eight six right now, going on the hunts and every hunt is different, every shot is different, um, and. I enjoy the culling a lot now. Yeah, and, yeah. and I don't think it's strictly just because, like, I'm bloodthirsty. Um, but, but you know, like, every time it is a legit adventure, stuff's going to happen. Yep. There, You can't script it like you can other things that you try to do. And that's why, you know, you come to the conclusion that it's just really an adventure and an ultimate adventure because it's very dangerous, which I think is probably an element of adventure. Yeah, for sure. So A lot goes into those. Uh and I would say one of the reasons you, and, and this is not just to give these guys a plug, it's because I miss them. Um, and Rad has been sending me messages lately. Andrew left me like a two minute um, uh, WhatsApp uh, audio recording the other day, just They're telling me, those. telling me they miss me and, and want me to come over and hang out. And like these two guys, uh, Andrew Pringle uh, and Rad Robertson are like, one of the reasons we love going over there is because we want to see those guys. Like we want to be, like in camp with those guys we want to hunt with those guys and have those sundowners with them at the end of the day like you're right that's a big part of the adventure part of the draw is going with those guys that's why we love crusader and and it's funny i did a crusader video and someone commented that like uh, this is too much of a paid ad and it's like i don't get paid anything from them like it's genuine love like we both hunted a lot of places and when you go somewhere and you're with them for every minute that you're not sleeping for weeks it's important like the best time you're going to have is to be with people you enjoy. And they're wonderful people sure. that we'll be friends with the rest of our For lives. For the rest of our lives. And like, I think I can see why people are like, okay, you guys push Crusader really hard. And it's like, it's because we genuinely love these guys and love hunting with them and love the camp and everything yeah. about going to that one place. I mean, I've hunted a bunch of great places, but you, you don't hear me bring them up nearly as often because yeah. those, these guys are just, I mean, they're good friends. Yeah, the most adventure you can have. They're so hospitable. You feel at home. And I pay the same price that everyone else pays for every animal. Yeah. Like, and, and I shoot 10 times as much as everyone else. And I will say, like, everybody that has gone over there on either my recommendation or the Field Ethos recommendation has sent me a message like, dude, you were so right. Like, this was amazing. Um, yeah. So, you know, I can see why people are like, man, you guys plug these guys a lot. But... They don't pay us to do it. We just love them. They do it. I mean, they do it right. I mean, you know, we went over and we'd been to Africa before and it still changes your life. And, you know, to me, building a house, by the time this comes out, my house will be finished there. But have, you know, I've got a plane there, a land cruiser there, building a house there. And it's because of them. Yeah, for sure. And But the hunting experience that you can have there, it's so different. Like you and I now love all hunting, like. Whether it's duck hunting, you go on an elk hunt, you do that. Yeah. But to go there, it's so, it's weird. It's high adventure. It's relaxed. It's a great time with people that you love. It's target rich. You know, when you think about an elk hunt is a wonderful hunt out west in America. But it could be two weeks and you don't shoot anything, which yeah. that's great. 
and it can be difficult with Crusader because it's in the mountains. You can have the most difficult hunt you want or an easy, easy hunt relatively because they're so like target rich. Yep. So since this is going to be a little while coming out, I can go ahead and talk about one of the things that we're working on that will be full force by the time this podcast drops, uh, Field Ethos Outrider Experiences. Um, so we will, you'll be able to go to our website, look at these different adventures that you can take. Um, we can handle all of your travel arrangements to go on these hunts. Oh, and sure. these are not just like your normal hunts. Crusader will certainly be one of these adventures. We're going to throw a lot of just random, not random, but other fun things into a trip. So you go to, like well, like you would go to, um, New Zealand, uh, and hunt, um, you know, hunt fallow deer or whatever but you're also going to go spear fishing um and you can do oh. some fly fishing we're going to throw some shit in there like we're, we're also like I, what i my input with the guys when we were talking about this was you know let's not just do what's already been done um let's throw like the field ethos vibe in there um uh, which is going to be like a top end experience with some wacky shit going on so um, go hunt a walrus with, with us um, while we're crabbing and, and, and do some stuff like that. So just some things that you might not think about as like uh, an adventure that as soon as you actually see them as an option, you go, holy shit, that would be cool. Um, so this isn't going to be the trip that everybody else offers. We're going to put our spin on these things. Um, oh, that's fun. Yeah. So it's going to be cool. Uh, you will certainly see Crusader Safari at the top of that list. Um, you yeah. Know, I mean, for a Southern Africa hunt or... or you know, because at uh, Rad and I will go, so I take him with me now everywhere because I trust him. He's wonderful. I have a great time with yep. him. So no matter where I go in Southern Africa, he goes with me. So we're going to Cameroon. We're going to the CIR. Yep. So we're going to the Congo to hunt next year. Uh, we go to Cameroon in January for War Derby Elon. Sure. Um, just a lot of great adventures. But I think it's important. Like part of the scary part. I think so. I'm glad you guys are doing this because, like, your group of guys involved in Field Ethos have so much experience going all over the world doing stuff. It's like it's scary because you don't know, you don't want to go spend two weeks and a bunch of money in a country and no one's ever been. You don't know what it's going to be like as far as your sleeping arrangements, the food, how yep. difficult it's going to be. And, and that's another thing that's different with Outrider, Field Ethos Outrider experiences is like an Outrider was somebody on mounted horseback that was your escort to go do something. So if you're like on the Oregon Trail, you have a few Outriders with you, some dudes that could handle some shit that were riding alone on horseback, just escorting you along the way. So you'd have some Outriders. So um, on most of these hunts, you will have a Field Ethos person with you on the hunt, just making sure everything is moving forward the way it should. Uh, if there is a hiccup along the way, um, in a, in a foreign country, it's going to be a field ethos guy that steps in and sorts that out for you. Oh, nice. Um, so yeah, yeah I think that's a lot of the scary part of yep. traveling abroad. And especially when you travel to a country where maybe you don't speak the language to yeah. hunt. Well, I mean, we've all like been to jail, you know, so like Scobie's been to jail and, and, um, in Zimbabwe, I think it was, um, Shane's been to jail in China. Um, I might've spent a night U S based, uh, jail system. Um, so like, you know, we, we, we're not afraid to like step in and, and help, help navigate through some of these sticky situations that you find yourself in, in a foreign experience that like you might not have even done anything. I was telling you about Mongolia the other day. Yeah. Mongolia. Or when we went to Argentina, like I was detained and missed a flight and almost yep. incarcerated just because I took the fix and they believed that it was a machine gun yep. because of the, they kept pointing to the selector cause it looks like an M16. And they thought that I was trying to smuggle in two machine guns. Yeah. And it took them, you know, like two or three hours to sort it out that it was actually a legit bolt action. Rifle. Yeah. And it's not that like, like it is not that we're running around breaking laws. Right. Sometimes things just happen. Like when I, I landed in Mongolia the other day, I had 40 rounds of ammo. Nobody told me that I could only come in with 30 rounds of ammo. And oftentimes these like slight little regulations you can't even find them online like you don't know until you show up and someone tells you about it so i show up with too many rounds um they they actually take take issue with this like big issue with this right and they they have me in the police station uh the customs office um and they go you know it's illegal to bring 40 rounds of ammunition in here you're allowed 30 we hit, we need you to sign this thing saying you did it by mistake and i look at it and it's all in mongolian and i'm just like negative like i don't want to be a problem. I'm not trying to be a problem for you guys, but I can't, I'm not going to sign that. I can't, 
read it. Like, I don't know if I'm signing something that's saying, you know, I'm a arms smuggler from the U S and I'm guilty for bringing yeah. in contraband. Like, I don't know what it says. So I said, look, I'm not signing it, not trying to be a problem. What I will do is write you a statement in English that says, I unknowingly brought 10 extra rounds of ammunition into Mongolia on a hunt. Um, and they, they conferred for way too long to where I thought I was in real trouble. And, uh, and then they came back, they're like, okay, you can write this statement and sign it and then you can leave. Um, but there's just weird things like that. So if you're on an outrider hunt and that kind of stuff happens, like we're going to be shoulder to shoulder, we're going to go to jail together. We're going to figure <laughs> that we're going to figure this thing out together. So yeah, you're going to be able to take advantage of, um, I think it's a small a part lot of, of it. Though. I think a lot of it is just having people that are like-minded that have been to these places and these are their experiences and you base these adventures on the good and bad from what you guys have learned yeah. personal experience it, ma- it makes it makes total sense well we've got you know we've got a lot of guys on on the team that have spent a big portion of their life traveling and getting into weird situations so yeah. if you think about the collective years of experience of traveling and adventuring uh field ethos has has a lot to offer in that regard uh, of how to yeah. how to navigate certain things. Well, you, you think is something as simple as an a lot of people go to Argentina to hunt birds. It's yep. very common for us, or you go to Spain to to hunt. But what people don't realize is Argentina. You know, that's not like going to Mongolia. But no one in Argentina speaks English. No, like they do not speak English. Nope, they don't so, have a person at customs there that's going to be able to translate for you. No, and so and, and that's just Argentina. Yeah. So, so think of like these other countries. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know. I can't, whether you're, yeah, in Mongolia or Iceland or Finland, or, you know, you're in Poland going on a, you know, a red deer hunt or something. Um, the language barrier sometimes can even be an yeah, issue. So having, sure. ha- having people who have been to these places and they had this good experience here and here's how this, this, you know, outfit handles these things, you know, it, it's, I mean, even the language, can you imagine like if, so we're in Argentina. M- my pH was Spanish and he grew up learning English. So he spoke English. So that made it way. But can you imagine like riding around for a week or two with a guy hunting with him and you could never speak? No, I did that for like the first couple of days in Argentina. And then I was like, this sucks. I'm jumping in with Pat. Uh, <laughs> and then I jumped in with you. And then we finished like the last half of this hunt, me, you and Pat riding around <laughs> together. Cause we had, a, we had a, we had a guy that could speak English. And it makes more of an adventure yeah. because we all know like we're going to, you know, we'll we'll shoot stuff, but it yeah, it's about the adventure yeah. mostly, and 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 doing it with your your buddies and just having a good time every day. Argentina yeah. was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was There's a blast. some wacky shit that went down there. Like, um, I was telling uh, Nick, so I stopped by Q yesterday. Yeah. You were you were on your way back from Boston, uh, and Mike and I stopped by Q, um, and I was telling him that I had no idea that this um that this murder of a farm turkey was going to turn into the product release video for your bipod and it's very fitting you know um it was just one of the wacky things that we do you know yeah um that was you know you can either chop the turkey's head off with him being terrified or you can let him go on a salt field and and just burn him down with a six five creed more <laughs> yeah i mean it was it, i wonder if people actually knew that whole story because i saw the video of you and pat talking about uh, like and i think i've told the story but if you guys watch this kickstand video that thomas yeah. did it shows pat hemingway Adam shoot this turkey. Well, the Skinners in um, Argentina lived in this house on part of the ranch, and they were incredible. Watching them work an animal, whoo! Um, but they loved animals, and they loved eating turkey. So they had turkeys that they bred, and yep. the breeder Tom was the biggest turkey I think we've probably ever seen. I don't know; it was the biggest turkey I've ever so seen. So when we w- the first time this turkey was spotted, Pat and I were in the truck together, and we pulled into the skinning shed to drop an animal off, and I said, "Holy shit, did you see that turkey?" And he didn't. But Pat also he's never turkey hunted before. Oh, I don't true. even know, I don't think they have turkey houses in Montana. I don't know that he's ever even really. Do seen they have a turkey. turkeys in Montana? I don't think so. I don't. I don't I, yeah, well, you and do. I grew yeah, up in do. the South. We see turkeys. Yeah, yeah, they do surely. But uh, Pat has never hunted one anyway. But this was like you know I've hunted hunted turkeys a lot, and this was a freakishly large turkey. And, the, and it was cool though too. We can't tell really in the video because the video that Thomas did is black and white. But it's gray and white. Yep. The turkey isn't yep. brown or anything. So it's very unique. Not Almost only is a it blue huge, gray. Yeah, yeah, it was an odd color. Well, we start joking about this turkey, and, and um, Pat's like, you know, 
this could be my first turkey hunt. And so we start laughing about it. We're like, dude, we could shoot this turkey and we can have a Thanksgiving with all of our friends. We're going to have a Friendsgiving in Argentina if you shoot this turkey. And, um, and so, you know, it's just these are the types of weird conversations that we have with our group when we're riding around drinking beer, just having good friend time. We, we talk about some of the funniest stuff. And so I, I'm, I'm back at the, the cabin at the end of the day and Pat comes in and he's like, I made a deal on the turkey. And I was like, no way, like you're going to do this. And he's like, yeah, oh, yeah. I bought I bought the turkey. I was um, with him. I videoed it. I don't know if we've shown it. He paid this guy like uh, one hundred and sixty dollars. One hundred and sixty dollars for a turkey. Oh. That that's a lot of money over there for a turkey. Yeah, the turkey. Uh, that's like a ten dollar bird. bird. I think he said bird. like a breeder like that would be like forty dollars. Okay. Okay. So 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 it was an expensive turkey. Very for expensive Argentina, acquisition. But, but he made you know like four x his money. So these guys know we're coming to pick this turkey up and we're going to take it out and kill it and then we're going to cook it. And so we go to uh, the skinning shed and I get out of the truck and I walk over and they've got this turkey and his feet are tied up. And I said, no, we're not we're not doing the the feet tied up deal. Yeah. Like, t- well, you know how that started was remember we had a bet. So I think we all still owe Brett Voorhees. We hadn't forgot about you, buddy. We're going to pay you. We all owe him 100 bucks. So it was everybody was in on the longest shot, the longest kill shot on the hunt. Um, everybody put in a hundred bucks and winner yep. gets it. So I think none oh, of yeah, us we do owe Brett, Brett. So we owe yeah. Brett a hundred bucks piece. So I had for most of the hunt had the longest shot and Brett with my own gun gets the longest shot. On a like, black buck, right? Like Merck's a black buck. I think it was it a fallow. A fallow or fallow? something. Yeah. And it was like, fi- um, so I had a shot at like 470 something. He shot something at like 570. And so where this got to be tethered, because I don't know if you were there for this part. So where Hemingway was brilliant was he was nowhere in the running to win this. So yeah. it would be like whatever, 600 bucks that you get. Yeah. And um, so he buys the turkey for 160. So he's going to tether it at 700 and shoot it at 700. Yeah. Long as, so brilliant, brilliant move. So I was like, I don't like the idea of tethering the turkey down and shooting it. But I can respect the fact that these guys are going to kill it within a year anyway and eat it. And this will be a humane death. And Pat figured out a way to game the system to win the six hundred dollars. So yeah, okay. But I was with you. I was like, we're not, we're not doing this. Why don't we just let it go? We give it a chance to fly off because yeah. they're like, you have to tether it. Because yeah. remember the Skinners and our PH are like, you have to tether it because he's going to fly off right no, away. I was like, we're doing I'm not this. sure that turkey can fly more than about ten yards. Yeah, we're going to let fate enter this contest uh between man and turkey and if the turkey survives uh and and flies out of there he wins the day he right wins. so that's that's fair right so i get these i'm like no you need to untether his legs so we take him out drop him in this salt flat pat's laid down in the salt flat on the bipod and he tries to put a headshot on this bird from 120 yards or something like that and and the turkey starts running and i'm like cheering on the turkey i'm like go go and uh, and then he stops and Pat tries to put another headshot in him and zips right past his head and he starts running. And I don't know why, but I'm re- I mean, Pat's one of my one of my best pals, but I'm rooting for this damn turkey. Like everybody wanna, was the yeah, underdog. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you want to see this turkey just just sees life. Right. Um, so uh, he runs again and then he stops and Pat has abandoned the headshot <laughs> idea. At this well, point. I mean, a head this big yeah, and it's always it's a, moving. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, that's a, almost an impossible deal. That's a luck shot. But so this turkey, when he stops stops the second time he just gets smoked and he, he dies instantly and, yeah, and we go pick it up i've got to send thomas this video so he can edit this little clip into the podcast but one of the funniest things pat goes out and he gets his bird and he walks back with this bird over his shoulder and well, remember we, for we that, all like we he all, was asking us like how do you carry a turkey yeah <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you sling it over i'm like you sling it over your shoulder hold him uh, hold him by the feet and his spurs and sling him over your shoulder so pat walks back up and we're like, we're treating this like it was a very proper achievement. So we've got our hats off and we're, we're shaking hands with them. But like the second person that I can't even remember who it was that steps up to shake, you know, Pat's taking this very solemnly um, and trying to be as serious as he can. But the second person that Pat shakes his hand has the funniest expression on his face because Pat is just so proud and so serious in this moment. And he makes this face. We're going to edit that into the podcast, Thomas. Can we do that? You can do that. Cool. He's, he's wearing that gaucho hat. He's wearing his gaucho hat. And I think he's got a, like a 40 ounce beer in the other hand as he's walking back with the turkey. It's just a great moment. It, it, but that's, I will good. say, like, 
you it's know, our most memorable thing on the hunt. Don, Don, Don gave me some shit about this um, when he saw that clip and we got back. And he's like, really? We're shooting fucking farm animals now? I go, dude, that's like the most field eat those shit ever. Like, go over to Argentina and have a hunt and then shoot a farm turkey. Like, that's like very well, on brand for us. Oh, and you think, too, it's ridiculous, but it was fun. And we ate it. The, the chef did a great job. We oh, ate man. it the next day. He stuffed it with uh, with uh, fallow deer. deer. Red, fal- yeah, something. something yeah, he stu- so he, he browned some uh, ground meat from a fallow deer or a red deer um, and seasoned it up with some spices, stuffed the turkey with that. It's delicious. And he was like... and, and uh, He had never th- cooked a turkey before. Well, he had never cooked a turkey, but somehow he saw the recipe for a turducken. And, he was like, <laughs> and, and he told like the only English-speaking guy there, and the guy's like... This is like your turducken. Is that right? And I was like, yeah, dude, that's right, actually. Um, so we that's had Friendsgiving cool. in Argentina, and all was right with the world. I mean, you think about it. It created a great adventure for us. Yeah. We got content for a bipod release. and um, But, you know. And a, and a farmer got $160, $160 for a turkey. <laughs> he's still telling. They were trying to sell all kinds of Remember the next day, us. he's yeah, like, half yeah. price. But so then he goes, and they would have killed that turkey and eaten it within a year. But now he, he went that weekend and buys four turkeys. Yeah. Everybody wins. Yep. Um, he's exponentially increased his turkey herd. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was a win for everybody involved. Yeah. Take that, anti-hunting. Yeah, we we'll use yeah. the whole thing, too. Yeah. That was very hectic was for me, that whole thing, because I was one of the advocates of tethering it to the ground. Oh, because you're trying to get the content. And I was trying to get the shots. So we made myself. Thomas bloodthirsty. I'm by myself. I have to get like three, four camera angles. You're flying a drone. Fast. You're flying a drone. Jason's in my ear like, we shouldn't tie it down. We shouldn't tie <laughs> it down. I think that's stupid. And I was like, at first, I was like, I was like, you know, the one guy that doesn't actually kill things is like, take this motherfucker down. <laughs> uh, well, I was like, at first I was like, you know what, Jason, I'll take a step back. And then I told Thomas, too, we, it's like you're going to get great footage no matter what. you. Because I was worried about getting the shot. Right. And then after the fact, I was like, man, I even went up to you. I even went up to you and I was like, I'm so happy that I listened to you because the, the footage is that much better of it just roaming running, around running. like an actual yeah i didn't want it to be like tied up by the feet yeah. but we had we brought a stake and we were going to tie one foot to the stake because i just i didn't think that we were going to get it if i didn't have ron dan on camera but that would have still been you know you could still have hyped this product with a win for the turkey you know be like sometimes it's not your day I also but it's not the bipod's fault i didn't know i was going to put it as the bipod yeah thing until yeah. we, we you know, it turned out really good. It's a really good product video, yeah, if you ask me. Like top video. level shit you did with that one, Thomas. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that is part of the adventure that you can't explain. Um, you know, because I love going hunting with the homies, and I also though love hunting by myself. Like, just I that's also an adventure for me. Yeah, and always a great story. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I mean, I now work. And I'm home, and all I do from the time I leave is think about the next the time next I get one. to go on a hunt. Yep, and you and I have been talking about some some things we're going to... Well, we already have some stuff kind of planned. Um, we've got Spain. Uh, yeah. We're going to do some bull... We're going to go to the bullfight, <laughs> um, yeah. which is a big part of this trip. Uh, yeah. Some some wonderful red wine and, and some bullfighting. Yeah, it's gonna be, that's going to be fun and interesting. We're going to go back to Africa. Um, Elephant. Yeah, we're going to do an elephant, um, but we were talking this morning about uh, Greenland. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that will be a fun adventure there or Iceland, either way. Go for caribou and the muskox and just a whole different kind of hunt and adventure and see what that's yeah. all about. Yeah, so yeah, we've got some uh, some Kevin and Jason uh, sundowners coming soon and some <sighs> random places with local beers. Yeah. Um, so that'll be fun, but um, I, I will say like, so... We're doing uh, we're doing some stuff with Taurus uh, on um, some close range like revolver hunting. Um, oh, that's cool! Yeah, we put out a video, uh, Thomas. Are you shooting with that uh, the single action? You dude, sh- that you got shot me fired a, up. You shot a goat, and um, that was another part of that adventure. The things in Argentina. So you go, you think, oh God, we're gonna we're gonna hunt red deer, and we're gonna they have they have awesome black buck in Argentina. Jesus, I love black buck. And yeah, they they're have awesome. Some of the massive most massive ones there but the two things that end up as most memorable out of that hunt are things you could have never scripted anticipated or even thought of you know you have a beer and you see that they've got this giant turkey at the skinning shed and you're like huh feeds everyone it'll be the cheapest meal we have 
and great content. And then the next thing is I, I had just shot something, and maybe it was one of the goats. I don't it know. It was a goat. They have yeah. feral goats there that kind of run around in Argentina all over the place, and there'll be these herds. And so I shoot. And they're mean. Yeah. And I shoot one at, I don't know, maybe I shoot one at like three or 400 yards or something. No? What was it? Was it close? It was less than 100, yeah. It was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that one did, was. That was a quick one. And um, and I think you had already shot one, and the skull looked awesome, and I wanted one of the skull mounts. Yeah. And so I shot one. So it wasn't something that was planned. We happened upon this herd of feral goats, like maybe eight or ten. Oh, yeah, they went. They were in the bush, and they were trying to get them they out. They were driving them out of this. Yeah, uh, so they were trying to drive them out of this thicket. Um, so, and and they eventually did it. And so that's what happened. And I, and I shoot one with a rifle, one that I want. And so we're sitting there, and the herd runs like a couple hundred yards away. And so it's funny. One, one of the PHs, he loved American cowboy stuff, apparently. He had a Ruger Vaquero and 44 Magnum, probably because that's Dirty Harry's cartridge. Yep. And had it strapped in some like thigh holster, old cowboy leather thing. And you were like, hey, can I try to shoot one of those with that? Yeah. <laughs> Jason stalks out. And at, what, 63 yards or something, shoots this goat in the head with a Ruger Vaquero with a rear notch and just a blade front I hit him in the shoulder, yeah. Oh, steam roll, but, but then <laughs> Pat says... Just face planted. I did shoot him a few more times when I walked up to him, uh, and Pat Pat said it scars him, it, it haunts him to this day, uh, watching me stand over this goat. And I was like, well, you know, he, he still had a little bit of life left in him. I had to had to put a few more in him, but I don't know. I wasn't that close, but I saw like, that first shot just face planted him. Yeah, oh. he did dumped him. Um, but so when the, the gaucho, which is, uh, what they call cowboys over there, like these guys are like, these guys are cowboys when they're not, uh, guiding. Right. Yeah. So they're ranching and he's got this vaquero on and I, um, he doesn't speak any English and I point at the pistol and I'm like, Hey, can I hold your pistol? And he, he can tell what I'm asking him. So he pulls his pistol out of his holster and he systematically takes every bullet out of it and hands hands it to me and I'm like, "Hey, can somebody tell this guy I want to go kill one of these goats with his pistol?" And they're like, "You can try it, but you're not going to get close enough to these things." So I pulled no, my I, and I was all about. It. I was like, hey, "There's no harm in trying. You guys yeah. just slowly stalk this. Let's see what happens." Yeah, because they didn't want to leave the area when we shot that one. Yeah, they moved a couple hundred yards away, but they didn't all take off. Well, I like. Once I started on this stalk of these things and that gaucho came with me, um, I saw this like this little tree, um, the yeah. only little tree out there. Yeah, the only thing in the and, middle. And I field. felt like if I could get to that little tree, embrace the barrel on one of those limbs and steady that pistol up, I had a pretty good chance. And um, and I actually have that pistol. Actually, my father in law's best friend has it now. Mike, uh, love love the guy, Mike Irvin. He he follows field ethos and stuff. So, anyways, um, so Mike and my father in law are good friends and. Mike loved my Vaquero 44 Magnum. It's a stainless oh, you steel had one. 44. I had one. I had the exact same gun, but in in stainless. And Mike like loved 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 this pistol. So Mike has that that pistol now. Anyway, um, but so I'd shot one of these the exact same gun before quite a bit, and they're very accurate. Um, yeah. They're 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 surprisingly accurate. So um, yeah, it, that that was such a high point. And I came back from that trip. And Brett Voorhees, CEO of Taurus, was with us. Very good friend of mine and yours yeah. and so much fun to hang out with. And Great Brett guy. was there and I was like, dude, like this was just that that part of this trip was so much fun. I'm going to start doing a little bit more of this with the pistol thing. And I've always like made fun of guys that hunt with pistols um, with like big and it's and it's specifically the guys that put like big telescope uh, or, or magnified optics on them. Am I talking too loud? No. Okay. So, like, if you put a big, like, scope on your pistol and you go sit in a deer stand, I'm like, what are you doing? Unless it's, like, regulation-driven, like, by a state that won't let you hunt with a rifle, um, and, and but they will let you hunt with a pistol set up like that, then I just think it's, like, one of the most nerdy things you can do. Um, and yeah, I guess that's some just me being think, a judgmental prick. Yeah, some, but, some people think that well, same thing with bows. Yeah, you know, like, so. I, I, I think it's nerdy. Other people think it's cool. I don't give a shit. Like, I hope they don't get mad at me. I like all of it. Yeah. I, I, I actually love bow hunting. Which some people hate for the same reason, but you know, it's like I don't know. Well, this is like bow hunting. Company, this so. is kind of like bow hunting, but you actually get to recover your animal after you shoot it. Yeah, so that's the thing with bow um, hunting. So, uh, so I told Brett, like, um, I want to start doing more of this, like, get up close with 44 Magnum and like some real horsepower, but get into bow range with some real horsepower. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to do some hunts um, with the Taurus 44 Mag Raging Hunters with aim points on them. Cool. And yeah. just like stick them in our backpack, climb up into an area where there's some game up there and get up close, sneak up close and just hammer these things with some real horsepower, you yeah. know, within 
40 to 60 yards. Yeah. So I'm really excited about that. But then last night, what I was telling you was that, uh, so Michael, I brought uh, one of my best friends, Michael Shuttleworth up here. Uh, he hails from England. He's really pumped because we're going to build some mini fixes. But I was telling you when we were looking at the mini fixes last night and we were looking at the uh, 8.6, I feel like if you want to do some really cool adventure technical stalking that the 8.6 uh, is kind of the ultimate weapon to do it with because you can get, it's, it's really light, so you can put it on your chest. You can get anywhere with that gun. Like you can hike high, you can hike far, mm-hmm. and you can take that gun and you can put like, you can put like a one to 10 or a one to six or whatever you want to put on it. And you've literally got a rifle that you can kill a white tail with. You can kill a mountain goat or you can kill sheep. You can kill a grizzly bear with it. Like you can literally kill everything with this gun and you can get it everywhere that you want to go. And then yeah. like you can, you can do some really technical shit with the, with the eight, six. And I think like at least right now, it, cause there's no telling what you're going to come up with later, but I do think for a truly ultimate utility gun, the new 8.6 will like is kind of the ultimate adventure gun. It is a true do it all, oh, and it's light you. enough. Think so. It's light enough to get it everywhere. Is what's so cool. So I want to yeah. do. So I'm going to do the Taurus stuff with the Taurus revolver and aim point, mm-hmm. um, and I may actually put a red dot on an 8.6 when I get one, um, just yeah. to force me to get up close. But then, dude, 8.6 up close is super terminal. So like, yeah, it's good even with the subsonic because you, you know I had I was using a 10 inch. So this is a 12 inch barrel. We yep. do an 8 inch which that folded is probably no longer than the Raging Bull. Yep. So this is um, the 12-inch gun. So with this, this is the one of the first 50 that we released. Um, so 12-inch barrel, it's got some fancy Cerakote from Coats of Anarchy on yep. there. Um, so 12-inch is what we designed all the ammo and everything around. But with an 8-inch barrel, it's, you know, you're just losing distance, basically, yeah. with going with the short barrel. But with the stock folder, it's probably the length of, like, the Raging Bull or whatever, yes, Taurus yeah. Revolver. Yep. But you have the supersonic and subsonic capability. And, you know, I usually, with this, uh, so I've hunted a lot the last year, year and a half with it as we're developing the round and the fast twist and the guns and all. So I've shot, you know, a bunch of Cape Buffalo with it, like, serious game. I just shot Cape Buffalo with the subsonic. But with that, I knew I was going to get close. And so I had a magnified optic. When I was over in Africa for the first part of the hunt, so I had um, a 1-8, to eight, I think, on it. And I took it off, and I put an aim point micro right here up front. is like a scout-style thing. Yep. And I zeroed that thing. I think it, um, I don't know, probably, I think we zeroed it 35 yards. We thought we'd get inside 35, and then I tested it 65, and we're talking like there was an inch of drop, so it was no big deal. Um, but I wanted that field of view. I didn't care about magnification. I was going to be close. And, you know, and I took just about a pound off the gun just by yeah. putting the aim point micro on there. So I have a five pound gun that I could kill any animal on the planet. See, with. And that's like when when I do. And at some point when you guys like start really cranking out these eight sixes, I want to come up and I want to build one that is really designed to force that hundred yards and in scenario. Right. So I want really I want a really short barrel. I want a really lightweight optic, whether that's like an yeah. aim point with maybe a magnifier uh, that I can yeah, you pop could off. Put a magnifier. Um, but I want to force that hundred yards and in. And for terminal performance, like that is kind of the ultimate lightweight gun that offers a ton of terminal performance and a really quick kill. So yeah. we're gonna set one up um, maybe this time next year that is optimized for oh, that'd be great. lightweight, long long, long high cunning, uh, forcing that hundred yard specific yeah. encounter and killing the animal extremely fast so i think it's pretty much the ultimate platform for that so i'm excited about it it's really cool i think you've done something something really cool with this one so oh, thank you yeah i think you know the guys have done a good job with it doing eight, are they six, are they for sale easy. on the site right now i don't know well probably by now yeah i don't are know. you guys taking back yeah, orders right I, now? i know that we yeah. did because in like that one day we got 1500 back orders or something dude so, when so you guys so you guys so. made this model and you sold it and then in one of our group chats, one of you guys sent me a link to Gun Broker where this gun was had bids on it for twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, one of the first fifty, which we sold for eight grand, and that was you know like a custom case of the gun you see here. So it had uh, you know a twenty something hundred dollar vortex one to ten, yeah. the Cerakote on the handguard and the stock, the um, uh, Reptilia mount came with a prototype silencer that we did so it's a pretty cool kit and we were trying to make it a reasonable price it's really cool to see for our company that the products will demand that on yep. like the second hand market but you know it's also i don't know how i feel it's a little annoying that people would 
you know, like we did it all charge right under eight grand retail and then somebody gets it, they put it on gun broker and they sell it for 20 grand. It's cool in a way, but you know, I wish the guy that's willing to pay 20 would have been selected to buy the gun. Sure. Today. Yeah. Well, but we had, we did that, um, collab, uh, illicit provisions, Q mag, field mm-hmm. ethos mag and Rhodesian brushstroke and somebody paid a hundred bucks for it and immediately went on and put it on gun broker for 250 bucks. A, a buddy sent me that the other day. I was like, well, I mean, if you want to pay two hundred fifty dollars for a magazine, that's up to you. Like, you know, it is what yeah. it is. I, I can see why you would say that. Uh, I think it's, I think it is a high compliment. Um, yeah. That it wasn't like somebody just went and parked it on Gun Broker for twenty five thousand dollars. I don't know what they set it at, but it had like eleven bids when I saw it, yeah. and it was twenty five thousand dollars and some change. So multiple people thought highly enough of it. It wasn't some guy just going and reselling it for twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, he let I, the market decide on that one. So yeah. that that should be flattering. Yeah, I think that was the first one. And since I think there's been five or six that have sold between like fifteen thousand and twenty five thousand yep. dollars. Yeah, it's cool. Um, and we'll, we'll see. You know, you and I are doing a collab, and so it's it's going to be less because I think is was it twenty five or thirty twenty five guns twenty five. Yeah. So it's uh, Rhodesian. Uh, what a sixteen inch proof research barrel. So or twenty six because I'm buying one. So it's going to be twenty six. Twenty six. Yeah. So a uh, proof research barrel, sixteen inch, three hundred eight. Sort of a nod to the Rhodesian soldiers and with Knight's Armament backup sight, sort of FAL style. Yep. I think there's a special sling and you and I for came one. up with this. It's been a while since we kind of came up with this in Africa yeah, probably um, because we were hanging ago. out with guy with guy. Yeah, who was um, a Rhodesian soldier who. Yeah is a, a ph in south africa now. so we came up with this idea just in the back of the land cruiser while we were having a beer like okay what are, what would we do if we did this like um we got to stick to 308 we got to stick to like a rhodesian camo um like how do we do like make this like kind of a nod to those guys like it's got to have irons because those guys carried those fals like there were yeah. like slight things that we could do to the fix to where um obviously it was never it was it was not an fal but we did things as like you know, as as a nod to those a guys. nod to that, but also a practical gun that for yeah. planes game in Africa we would want absolutely sixteen inch three hundred eight with a good bullet is a perfect rifle for hunting and it truly is in Africa and we've seen that out to mm-hmm. four hundred five hundred yards. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I killed a water buck that old water buck by the way. Uh, we put those up in oh, the house yeah. the other oh, day, yeah. and I put that old like broken off one that mm-hmm. that you and I killed underneath. Uh, one that I killed a few years before, and it just like I love that. Yeah, all the skew horn, broken horn, all the old stuff. Those are really the trophies now that that I go after. But yeah, I mean it's a it's a great rifle because we'll see people over there. Like I love you. You obviously love three hundred one mag. I love, I love three hundred one mag. And if there's like only one cartridge that I could have forever, maybe it's the thing. Um, you know, it's a great all around. But do you know we see guys come over there with like mountain rifles that weigh six pounds 301 mag and they can't shoot them yeah because it's too much gun for them yeah and you know it's like you can be effective over there with a 6.5 with a 30 out six with a 308 with a good bullet selection and with a short barrel yeah um, i think like so i'm you know i get asked all the time especially on the sunday q a stuff um you know if you could only have one gun what would it that's be? that's a cool thing what you caliber? do like you cover a lot of information with I, your instagram I sunday do. the Q&A. last couple of weeks i haven't you know like i've just had family stuff going on on sundays so I've, I've i don't know answered maybe 40 or 50 questions instead of 100 or whatever mm. it normally is but um you know the so we did a collab with uh griffin and how um mm-hmm. you know, you well, i have one upstairs oh yeah oh you got yours already mm-hmm. okay cool what do you think about it? Because I was supposed to get it like six months back to shoot an elephant with. And um, honestly, I don't even know that I've picked it up. Really? Because I needed it. I got them to hurry for a hunt and they missed the hunt. And it came in and it came in right like the day before I was going on my last trip. So yep. wherever I went to Africa or somewhere. Yeah. So it's actually in, in the gun room. So we'll get it out later and take a look at it. Yeah. So kind of the premise behind that one was, um, you know, 300 Win Mag is my favorite cartridge. Mm-hmm. Um because the most of the hunting I do, it is truly perfect for. If I could it's a only, great if cartridge. I could only have one, and we'll see. The eight six might be um, people's one gun, but if I could only have one, traditionally that that is all. My answer is always a three seventy five Holland and Holland, because there are areas that you and I go hunt in where that's the minimum. 
that you're allowed to use if yeah. you're going to hunt a buffalo or something in yeah, the dangerous, dangerous game, in the yeah. dangerous game category. So you legally have to have a 375. So like at a minimum, I feel like if you're going to only have one gun and you want to do some of the things that you and I do, it has to be a minimum of 375. I, I think based on that, because of some laws and regulations, I would pick. I would probably have a 16 inch 375. See, and and because yeah. because you have to meet that threshold, then it changes yeah. what your answer would be, right? Yeah, it's um, like a, it's if you live in the Midwest, and what cartridge would you have? Because there's so many regulations on rifle cartridges for hunting, it's going to skew what you would say. Yep, the Is 300 the Win Mac. But um, but so we did this 375 Holland and Holland. and y- you know it is a buffalo and elephant killer at 15 steps. Um, but it's also an elk killer at 500 yards, yeah. right? It's it in these these guns that Griffin and Howe built are exceptionally accurate. Michael Murphy test fired mine. It was like less than half an inch uh, MOA. So I mean, it was it was it's a shooter. Yeah, and so it's capable for long range killing. What's well, a great card? Well, you, you know, a lot of people probably don't know, but the three the 300 Win Mag was taken from the 375. Correct. It's basically a 375 neck down to 30 cal. Right, exactly. A belted belted yeah, case. Yeah, it's and, a belted case. Um. So, but anyways, it's really cool. And you and I have, you know, just along our travels, we've talked about um, maybe one day seeing that uh, in a Q product, a 375, which which gets you into those countries yeah. to do. Uh, the dirty deeds that we like to do. Yeah, yeah, on, on the dangerous game. It's a thing because if I'm wanting to test 8.6, because a lot of people think, because I'll get comments or whatever, you know, it's like the internet know-it-all haters where, oh, you can't hunt in Africa dangerous game with less than 375. Well, that's not every country. Yeah. And the idea for me with 8.6 is like we do all this testing, this theoretical stuff, and we have a bunch of engineers, and we can talk all the shit we want. And then we can show gel test. And most people yeah. can understand what we're saying with fast twist and 8.6 when we show a gel test, just comparing twist. Um, but at the end of the day, somebody's got to go out and kill stuff. Yeah. And so that's been my job the last year, year and a half. And so we started with the supersonic. And now it's like I just shot a Cape Buffalo with subsonic with yep. a 10-inch barrel with this 315 grain Hornady sub X. And that buffalo this was more is equal to or more effective than anything i've ever shot a buffalo with the supersonic a bigger cartridge because you know what people need to understand like this is this is a well 375 killed this cartridge this is 450 400 so my double rifle which this is a compact lightweight gun it's two shots but this is almost an 11 pound gun with iron sights yeah and it shoots this big cartridge so this is killing for killing dangerous game so this is for elephant it's a stopping cartridge i mean yeah colonel corbett used this gun and this cartridge to kill like 800 man-eating cats so like tigers and leopards and shit but it's for shooting that kind of stuff but the guns are big the cartridges are big they recoil they're expensive the guns are heavy it you get two shots in there so trying to get this capability and something this size where you can have a five and a half pound gun where you can kill anything. You know, yeah. part of that has been fast twist. So, you know, I can't wait. We're going to continue to explore fast twist and push it. We're going to do the proper fix, which you were talking about, which Rad's named. It was originally called the mega fix. So the larger fix and 300 win mag and in these African cartridges. So we have a gun where you can hunt anywhere. Is it going to be called the proper fix? Proper I fix. I love that. Nod to Rad. Yeah. Yes. And, um, so we're, can we're, I plug one more gun and talk to you about it? Yeah. Um, so you and I think the double rifles are so cool. Yeah, like it's we, awesome. we definitely want to go do like an elephant hunt and buffalo hunt, mixing the old way with the new way. Like yeah, do sure. the double rifle and shoot shoot with the fix. Do both because we like we like the nostalgia and the modern. So mm-hmm. we want to do both. Um, have you ever heard of a funeral grade double? Mm-mm. Okay, so like all the London best firms, uh, and I was telling Michael about this yesterday because in England you really can't have a gun almost um, in very specific circumstances for hunting. But the finest firearms, and and this being one of them, um, were London best guns, right? Yeah. So so it's whatever. There's probably like ten companies or however many. Rigby. Um, you had uh, um, Holland and Holland. Jeffries. And, and, yeah, yeah, Wesley Holland Richards, Holland. and all these all these like iconic. Uh, London best firms that were making wonderful shotguns and rifles and they got into bolt action rifles anyways um so they did uh, a they they all got on this thing where they every once in a while they would do a funeral grade which is like you know they would do really intricate engravings and stuff like that on the um on the actions and the funeral grade was just a deep blued action very plain uh oftentimes zero engraving 
deep dark bluing on all the metal and then beautiful wood so it's just plain beautiful wood and jet black oh i thought you were, oh that's it, it's it, funeral. i thought yeah. you were gonna say it was all ornate and stuff. no and so this was just it was like the hearse of a gun oh. um so just like cool concept so creek off international are you very familiar with it, their mm-hmm. products so they make a double rifle that is very safe to carry behind your ph because you can decock it and when it's time to shoot, all you do is you push your thumb forward and it recocks the gun. So you're not carrying a double rifle with cocked hammers and, you know, 500 grains of, of lead in front of it, you know, <laughs> which is sister, which which if you have a if you have an accidental discharge, it's about as catastrophic as, as, as it's going to get. Right. Ooh, yeah. So um, so Kriegoff makes one that's incredibly safe to carry um, and very highly thought of by some PHs over there. They are, um, they asked me like, you know, how do you want yours to look? They, they're making me one. And I said, let's do a funeral grade. And to them, like that, that's gotta be kind of music to their ears because they don't have to engrave it. They don't have to do all this other stuff. And I don't think anybody is really doing funeral grades anymore. So I'm excited to show you this well, funeral the, grade. Creek I can't wait to in. see it. You know, like th- this is a, a fairly basic double for a yeah, London best. It's a beautiful gun. But, you know, it has engraving. It's got beautiful wood. You know, it's a shorter barrel, which I wanted. It's, it's one of the lighter weight ones. But, you know, it's like if I'm going to get a double and I can't put silencers on it, you know, and these are difficult to do because they have to align the barrels. Regulation. It's all handmade. Yeah, yeah. they're regulating. And, and, and so it, it's a bitch. But like you said, Kriegoff's one of the companies. There's German companies and some French companies that make great quality that you can, that are way more affordable than Because yes. this gun's 100 yes. years old or yep. older than, more than 100 years old. Yep. Um, and still very serviceable. I mean, oh, it's yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I'm going to hunt with it. But yeah, if I were. I mean, it would make more sense to pro- to get a Krieg off or something. It would be a third of the price of this gun, and you can use it but in it, its it, modern manufacturing. But you've got a London Best gun, and that's cool. That's always, it's cool. That's well, always cool. It's just like this Griffin and Howe, 30 6 So this is a, a total nod to Hemingway. Yep. Um, this is almost exactly like the gun that he used in Africa. 1903 Springfield action. Yeah, I mean, and this is made within a few years of the gun that he had. But this is the same setup, 30 6 with the scope mount, peeps the whole the whole thing is, is like his you know and Hemingway was used to the 03 Springfield from the wars and so this was a great thing to him so he used it but I guess Pat told me like he didn't like the scope and scope mount so he never used that typically used the irons um but my goal with both of these guns is to export them to Africa have them there and they're at the house and when people come over to hunt with me or stay it's like you're gonna shoot something with these guns and you know at Griffin and how they have these the logs like from the time they started making guns where every gun so they have the history to him yeah. is in there and all that so i wanted to do like a leather bound book and like jason vincent comes over to hunt with me hey you got to shoot a kudu or something with this jason gun. vincent shot a baboon in the face with the 450 400 <laughs> double rifle <laughs> yeah. yeah and there'll be a picture of you there in the book with the date and all the stuff and you know my goal with this would be over the next 10 years that we do that. Everybody kills someone that had the picture in there, the book, the history of the gun, and then sell the gun and the history or whatever to yep. somebody. But that'd be kind of a cool part. But I think, you, you know, the, like I want to hunt with my stuff and all, obviously, but the, the heritage of the hunting in Africa by Americans or, you know, or even Corbett, who I guess is a British guy, he may have been born in India or whatever. I don't know, actually. If, if I'm not was, sure. But, yeah. you know, he killed, like, I think 800 cats. He used the 275 Rigby quite a bit on um, on tigers and, and leopards and things. Well, did you see where his... So he had this this gun, yeah. uh, Jeffries in 450. He's, he made them model. famous. Yep. Yes. And his sold at auction, I think, in 2019 for 300 grand. And I watched a video on it when they were promoting it. And there's no bluing left on the gun except under the forend. Yeah. And, like, he used the gun. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, still shooting and stuff, so it's kind of cool. Um, Maneaters of Cumanyan uh, is something that every boy should read. Um, that is a uh, Corbett book um, about shooting tigers, and it is kick-ass. You ever seen, like, photo? Oh, I guess you have photos of him and all. Like, Thomas, he makes you look like a heavyweight. Oh, he's a little fella. He's this little scrawny guy yeah. that would go wait up in trees at night for a leopard. Yeah. You know, man eating leopards to yeah. show up so you could shoot them. Read in the face. read the Corbett stories. Ooh. They're amazing. What a man. Um so Rob Gearing, Spartan Precision, who also makes really cool bipods. Uh it, oh, yeah. English fellow, you know Rob. Um well, I, I don't know him, but I I know the bipods. Okay. Yeah. Um so Spartan Precision uh, Precision, his daughter, um uh 
she is an exceptional artist. Uh, she is very, very talented sculpturist. Is that the right word? For sculptor. Somebody? Sculptor. Yeah. Sculptor. Did I say sculpturist? Okay, whatever. Um, moving on. Um, <laughs> but she did. She was hired by um, by Rigby to do a, a sculpture of Corbett shooting uh, his 275 Rigby one handed at a tiger, which is part of one of his legendary one of his legendary stories. Um, and this thing was like contact close. This thing was like right off the barrel. Um, and he smoked it. But anyway, something really cool to go look at the Rigby sculpture from, uh, from Corbett shooting a lion. Man, Corbett was 120 pounds and he was 80 pounds of testicle. Yes, he, yes, he was. <laughs> His balls made up for a lot of that weight for sure. Oh my Lord. Um, but yeah, we're going to do the, the proper fix in Magnum and uh, even up to 338 Lapua Magnum, but yep. in African cartridge, it'll be a barrel, uh, bolt head swap, and we've got a universal magazine um, that we're developing, which is a very special part of that gun. But what you know, with Fast Twist, what we're learning, what we learned with 300 Blackout, and then doing 86, what we've learned and what I'm seeing on target, you know, I can't wait to do a 375 16 inch with a Fast Twist. Yeah. You know, because let's turn the twist up on that, and because you know you shoot a lot of solid coppers in those anyway, whether it's a Barnes bullet or you know, whatever it is, or, you know, all the bullets are bonded or solid copper. So we can turn the twist way up just like we did in eight, six. Yep. So we can get experiment you know, with th it. this performance out of a much That'll smaller or shorter barrel. Cause imagine a three seventy five with a 14 inch barrel. Cause in most of those countries, they don't have barrel length restrictions, 14 inch barrel with a four inch silencer on it. So th then you can hunt with three seventy five without you're going to do protection. You're going to do three seventy five Holland and Holland and not three seventy five Ruger. Correct. Okay, thank, thank. I'm sweet, not even answering. Thank that sweet baby question. Jesus, because anytime I ever post something about the 375 Holland and Holland, some nerd and there's there's one who's a friend of mine, huge nerd. He's like, oh, the 375 Ruger is so much better. And I'm like, whatever. It's improper as fuck. Like you don't you don't go to Africa with a 375 Ruger. Well, I know people do it, but they they should be caned. Well, I mean, people say stuff like that. Well, okay, well, 338 Lapua Magnum is better than 375. I mean, like, where do you draw the line? F yeah. 50 BMG is way point, better. At some point, you just got to be proper. And uh, that's a 375 Holland and Holland. I think so. Yeah. Long action, you know, but I think are the like the Ruger cartridges, I think were designed to be able to go into shorter actions or something. Yeah, so, non-belted, which, you know, headspace issues shoes are solved there but, you know, so you can probably get a little better accuracy but yeah. you're shooting animals inside of 100 yards with that stuff typically yep. like I, I yeah it, some of it's splitting hairs it was like what's the real popular one now is it 300 prc or something 300 prc yeah so that's an awesome cartridge i've made some long range kills with oh that one. Yeah. yeah but but for the average guy like one thing that's great about 375 or even 300 wind mag when you're anywhere else in the world you can find that ammo yep be in you Africa or Mongolia. PRC. Yeah, be in Africa or Mongolia or somewhere and go find PRC or even um, 375 Ruger ammo. Yep. So one of the um, one of the outfitters on this Mongolia hunt was actually bringing two 375s to camp. He's going to be down there for, uh, I'm sorry, two 300 Win Mags to camp because he's going to be down there for quite a while. It's the very beginning of the season when we went down there. And just to pick his brain, I know why I, I would take a... Hours. I'm sorry, Jason. No problem. I know why I would take a... Um, I know why I would take a 300 win mag, and I just wanted to see if his reason was the same. I said, why Why did you bring 300 win mag down here? And he said, because even in Mongolia, I can find ammo for 300 win mag. And yeah. I was like, but I, th I think it's true. It's the, you know, you know how I originally thought about that. It's the first time I hunted with Don, actually, and the first time that I met him outside you so of, much, um, you know, like in a, a social setting. Um, we went on a hunt together, and a couple of his, like, New York friends came that um hunt, hunt with him and they hunt uh, all over the world and stuff too and um they had blousers a couple of guys had blousers mm. and they had 300 wind mag and yep. so you know i i like blouser rifles a lot i like 300 wind but just asking them the questions like why do you always hunt with this and their big thing that was their thing and i hadn't thought about it that time because i hadn't hunted a ton internationally then yeah was they said you know, they go on lots of hunts every year, and they're like, we can get this ammo anywhere in the world. And there probably are. You know, like 300 PRC is better. But is it better if you can't get ammo when you're somewhere? Like, how much better? Yeah. Like, I don't know. We've got a collab coming out with Mick Order Custom Rifles. Um, they make long-range custom hunting rifles. And nice. um, it is a 300 Win Mag cut to uh, 22 inches so that when you put a, put a silencer on the end, it's not 
you know, you don't look like you're a radio man from World War II with that thing sticking up off your shoulder. Um, and it's just, you know, we could have gone with 300 PRC. There, there are calibers that are far ballistically superior to a 301 mag for just about any long range scenario, but I've lost ammo on a trip before. I've had ammo not not get from Does point A to show point B. Up and, or they and take it in customs or other so for the that? standard calibers, your standardized calibers, you want three hundred win mag. Yeah. Or, well, let's let's start from the bottom. You want twenty two long rifle, two twenty three, three oh eight, three oh eight, thirty out six, three hundred win mag, three seven five Holland and Holland, and then you get um, into the bigger stuff that's a little bit more obscure. But those are the I those mean, are the, the ones that you're the, always those be are able the to find. real staples, and yeah. there's a great argument for that when when people talk about. Because there's people who are still. Because I, I love that you pick on like six five Creedmoor. I like six five a lot. Yeah, but you know, there's the people who are into six five, but there's also the ones that it's even a different sec than you. It's two sixty is far superior because you can, you know, if you hand load. And yeah, and if you don't need to fit it into a, an existing magazine, if you want to use current long bullets. So then it's like okay, and who who loads two sixty commercially? Yeah. Um, well, the Hornady six five ammo is terrific and shoots you know under half MOA, and that's a no brainer. Before COVID, you know, it's a a dollar and a quarter around for great ammunition that kills and is super accurate, and it's far less recoil than three oh eight. And so, like I've talked about it before, I got into it when my kids started hunting and shooting because they were still very little and they learn to shoot far and and so having less recoil and yep. shooting flatter was an advantage it and is awesome like so when i when i jokingly did the uh on the first day of gay pride month um posted something about the six five creed more happy gay pride month whatever i got a ton of messages of people like you oh, hate you hate six it. five creed more and i'm it's like, like me uh, with the mp absolutely not i love it like i've killed a ton of stuff with it, it i think for um for like that medium caliber size, I think it is 100% the way to go. I love it. Nothing wrong with it. People just are so crazy about it. I have to make fun of it, you know, because yeah, people hype I, it up I, so I, much, but it is awesome. Yeah. I mean, I would, I mean, the reality is if you're inside 300 yards, 308 is still better. And if you're beyond 300 yards, 6.5 is better. Yeah. Um, but bullet selection and make a decent shot. Those are the, the, the main things. It's, it's like I think 300 PRC is better than a Win Mag. I don't know that I'll ever have one, and it's for the reasons that you talked about. But you know, you're saying doing a 22 inch barrel. The great thing about Win Mag at a 16 inch barrel, it's an 800 meter killing gun. Yep. Yes, it so, is. So my gun will my proper fix in th my 300 Win Mag barrel will be 16 inches. Yep. And um, you know, and I'll probably try to extend it a little beyond with, with the shots. But 800 yards. I, I mean, if I go on a Three week month long hunt in Africa. I maybe shoot one animal over eight hundred yards, and I probably shoot yeah. hunting farther than most people on most. For hunts. sure, and like that's just so far. Um, but that'll do everything. But also, you know, like we're going back to three seventy five, so I'll probably start using that a lot over there testing too, because with the African cartridges, what you talked about is all that hunting. You know, like the PHs. So Rad, his, his like dangerous game backup. Is a four fifty eight lot, which is very popular over there with PHs for dangerous game backup rifle. But you know, he's got like a twenty two or twenty four inch barrel. And I'm like I cut my four fifty eight lot to twenty three. You did? I did. See what if what if we went from uh whatever the twist is, it's probably a one eleven, one in twelve. What if we went to a a one in four and you use solid copper bullets and you could have a sixteen inch That's barrel? That's the move. That's the move. Then you could have a silencer that's shorter than your 23-inch barrel. You don't have to shoot with ear protection. Yeah. And and it's lethal, like we're showing it. The BC goes up, but that rotational energy. And, you know, the thing with the fast twist, the bigger diameter of the bullet, the more fast twist works. So those big cartridges, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to see you spin those things up. A 375 it's gonna be spinning. Fun. That's cool. Just very cool stuff. By the way, spinning and spinning. this um, I don't know. I mean, th these guys might be the worst people on the planet, but they deserve great a rhythm. shout out by this. The, uh, great rhythm pineapple mango sour. It's delicious, isn't Dude, it? Refreshing. It is. I mean, it's bougie, no. but it's good. Cheers to uh, oh, to the cheers, next ones. To the next ones, and thank Can't you wait. for thank you for um, oh, yeah. having us up here and. Uh, thank you for giving me five minutes notice that I was going to be on a podcast today. and It's how uh, I roll. Yeah. But, man. Hey, well, thank, thank you thank for you. that fucking omelet this morning. That was incredible. You're very welcome. Yep. Yeah, I like the omelet. God, that was so good.
And um, yeah, thanks for coming up. And man, thanks for what you guys are doing at Field Ethos. It's so cool. Like I've been inspired by hunting and I don't know how, but I love it so much. And just like you, I want to share it with yeah. people that maybe didn't in, in my situation is different than yours, but I grew up not hunting, Yeah, you know? And so I understand if you're into firearms and you enjoy firearms, this is another adventure you can try. And it might not be for everyone, but I think you'll be shocked. And I really appreciate what Field Ethos is doing because you guys are also presenting it in a new and fresh way that can relate to people in the industry, but also people who have maybe never done it. Because I love hunting so much, I will watch a boring hunting yeah. show, but I fast forward a lot and it aggravates me. Well, if I can leave people with one thing, like if they listen to this whole podcast and they got all the way here, you know, we have talked about this buffalo that Kevin killed with Thomas running several times not one time did kevin or thomas ever mention the actual shots that killed the buffalo they mentioned thomas running away from the <laughs> buffalo climbing a tree thinking kevin was going to die that kevin had to use one of thomas's socks to wipe his ass at some point those are field eat those stories not the shot stories like those are the those are the stories that i like to tell like the things yeah. that the things that you'll remember for the rest of your life <laughs>